Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Certainly many of us are aware of the growth of reality TV. Now, not actors, but regular people being set in certain scenarios, or even worse, I would say, just documenting their lives. I really don't get it. I don't understand it. I think it really is just a further pr promotion and preoccupation with self. But if you find it interesting to watch how the doggers live their lives, even though they're not really on anymore, but it seems like just anyone at any point can pop up and say, oh, this is a rally reality. We're going to follow these people and Kate Nashley or whatever, you know, actors or, you know, whether it's Survivor or Fear Factor or the, uh, just various things that have, uh, The Bachelor, you know. But, you know, what we find is you look into those reality TVs and in many ways they're anything but reality. Like you talk to people that have maybe been uh, asked to do a reality show or, or in the midst of it and how they're always trying to promote conflict. They're trying to say, what are the problems you have with your family? Let's, let's highlight that and make sure that comes up in conversation. But now when we think about the nativity of Jesus, now that is a real reality. I mean, imagine an episode of The Bachelor. Uh, two young people visited in Nazareth by an angel, saying they would birth and nurture the Son of God. How about the amazing race of the wise men who saw a star and traveled to see what it all meant? Or the ex extreme makeover of the shepherds who were outcasts of the Jewish society, but were the first to be welcomed to view the born, newborn king. It's really these shepherds that I would like to draw our attention to this morning, so if you turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, that's where their story is found. And really consider the extreme makeover that comes over them, and ultimately that extreme makeover that God would like to foster in our lives as well. Now, when you think about shepherds and Jewish society, and in that time, and even first century society, they were really low on the rungs of the social ladder. Ultimately, because they could not fulfill many of the demands of the Mosaic Law, especially those things, those, that, those man-made aspects of, of interpreting or defining the law, they couldn't um, ultimately operate in those because of their responsibility around the sheep. And so they were rejected by the religious class. They were actually one of the groups of people that their testimony was not allowed in court. That ultimately, if a shepherd witnessed a crime, he would not be respected in the courts to be able to give his opinion or his perspective. I think it was because of the lifestyle of taking care of sheep and all the time and responsibility and kind of away from the normal routines of people, it oftentimes attracted the outcasts of society. But what's interesting is that in the Bible, the Bible actually sheds pretty positive light on shepherds. Abel, Abraham, Isaac, David and Amos were all shepherds. In fact, God refers to himself as the shepherd of Israel. And naturally, for those of us familiar with the New Testament, the Gospel of John, and what it says about Jesus, he is the good shepherd. And that's important for us to understand, because sheep are particularly defenseless, stupid, dirty, and in need of constant care and leading. You know, it's actually the needy aspect of what sheep are that actually drives the need for a shepherd. I mean, ultimately, sheep are really unique in the fact that they really have no means of protecting themselves. They, they don't have horns to defend themselves. They can't run very fast. So again, they are completely vulnerable in that, and that's why they need a shepherd. Ultimately, there's no way for them to address the needs on their bodies. They'll have festering sores, and if someone doesn't come along and take care of it, it would ultimately destroy them. And even in terms of them, uh, you know, if they, if they're very easily startled, and they very, uh, will, will automatically kind of follow another sheep. So if you have a, a group of sheep on a, on a cliff and they get startled, they'll follow each other off the cliff. They'll eat rocks and sticks if they're not led to good places. And so that's, that's, that really is, again, the picture of what drives the need for a shepherd. But also when we see the dynamic of God calling himself a shepherd, it really doesn't bode well for our self-sufficiency. Because if he's the shepherd, then who are the sheep? <laughs> that, that's us. But you know, what's neat about the, you know, really the picture that a shepherd brings is really God's desire to take care of us. You know, when you think about Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. He protects me. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. All these things, pictures of what a shepherd does for sheep. 
and what God is willing to do for us. Really, the question is, are we willing to admit our need? See, that's ultimately what God, as our shepherd, is looking for, is for us to say, yes, God, I realize I can't be self-sufficient. I realize I'm not able to take care of myself. And God says, well, good, now I can be your shepherd. Because if you want to try and take care of yourself, well, guess what? God will let you do that. But again, the whole picture of sheep and shepherd that this passage gives an opportunity to think about, again, is just talking about the nature and character of God and his desire to take care of us. But now back to our shepherds in Luke chapter 2. Really, verse 8 in chapter 2 describes a pretty typical night in terms of the life of a shepherd. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And again, that, that, that's what they did. Again, it's a constant awareness, it's a constant hearing and seeing and looking. Is there a predator? Is there, are noises coming from the sheep that, 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 that expresses that they're in danger or they need something? And again, that's what they would be, they'd be occupied with. Now, one interesting point about these shepherds is that it's possible that the sheep that they are actually tending to are sheep that would be used in temple sacrifice. Basically, two times a day, the law would dictate that she, a, a lamb would need to be sacrificed in the temple. Now, that's a lot of sheep, and that's a lot of lambs. Uh, so ultimately, Bethlehem was a place where those sheep were tended. So it could be possible. It's not outlandish to think that these sheep, these shepherds rather, were taking care of sheep that would ultimately be the atonement, or would be an expression of the blood spilt that sin required for us to be cleansed before God. So it isn't it interesting that these shepherds would be the first to see the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. When you think about that statement that John the Baptist says about Jesus. And it's these shepherds that see Jesus for the first time. And again, if they are in fact that the shepherds taking care of these, of these sheep. But again, in terms of just what verse 8 is communicating, in terms of just the normalness of their experience, then the way God acts sometimes just bang. All of a sudden it's different. Just imagine, you know, you, you imagine, as I, well, hopefully you imagine, I know I do a lot, like what it would be like to be there. You know, you wouldn't be a fly on the wall. In this case, you'd probably be in the, a fly on a shepherd on a sheep's back. But just to be there and, and see what this was. To see, to experience what this felt like. To all of a sudden have an angel of the Lord appear to them. And the glory of the Lord shone, shone around them. And they were terrified. Now understand, there's actually two things appearing here. It is an angel and the glory of the Lord. Now three other times in the nativity accounts. In the gospel accounts of the, the, the birth of Christ. Three angels up to this point have visited people. And there's never been a mention specifically of the glory of the Lord. But here, this angel comes along with the glory of the Lord. And I imagine that is another reason for these, these shepherds to respond in fear, to react in that way. You know, ultimately, I don't know what the glory of the Lord looks like. I don't know what it feels like. But I can understand in terms of the majesty and power that is there. When you think of Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah gets a vision of this, and what is his only conclusion? To be driven to his knees, to ultimately recognize his sinfulness, to recognize his, his inability to be in the presence of God. I'm a sinful man amongst a sinful people, and but for the coal that comes to cleanse his lip, there's no hope for me. There's no place that I have in God's presence. And so ultimately, that is the right response to the glory of the Lord. You know, when I think of what Revelation speaks of in terms of every, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. You know, I think it will be the glory of the Lord that will accomplish that. I, I, I think people won't be able to help it. You will have the deepest and darkest atheist, you have the evilest person that's ever lived, and guess what? They will be driven to their knees because there's no other conclusion to come to when you're in the glory of the Lord. Amen. And so it really does come down for us, are we going to recognize that glory now when there's time, or are we going to recognize that glory when it's too late? 
And ultimately, now is the time. Again, look at what the angel says. That even though he can see the fear in the shepherd's eyes and their reaction, he says, don't be afraid. I haven't come to reinforce that fear. I've come to dispel that fear. See, I have good news for you. I'm not here to talk to you about judgment. I'm not here to talk about the power and glory of God that will smash you like a bug, even though we could. And that's part of what the glory of the Lord communicates, I think. But ultimately, it is grace, it is kindness, it is mercy, it is salvation that this angel is communicating. And so just look at what he does say. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Now, don't miss the significance of all the things that the angel says here. I mean, certainly we've already talked about the don't be afraid and dispelling that. But I bring you good news. I mean, who doesn't like good news? Who, who doesn't like things that, again, talk about what is favorable to us, that is helpful to us, that, again, you know, and oftentimes we're confronted with a uh, comment from people, what do you want first, the good news or the bad news? That also I think the angel would be saying to, to these shepherds, saying, well, what do you want first, the good news or the good news? In terms of all that Jesus has come to accomplish. Because ultimately, when you think that it's good news of great joy, I mean, this just keeps getting better. I mean, when you think about, again, what many people are looking for in terms of their lives, in terms of fulfillment, abundance, joy, contentment of heart, all the, the things that we ultimately need that God is saying that He is bringing. See, that's good news. Anyone that comes to me and says, hey, you know something? I've got an offer for you. I have an offer for you to bring you great joy. Well, guess what? That's good news. Who, who, who doesn't want that? But again, God is bringing that to us on his terms. See, one thing that defines God as God in terms of being the authority, being the king, that we, have, we need to come to him on his terms. But when we come to him on his terms, the result of that in our lives is great joy. The result in that in our lives is good news. When you think about, you know, just Jesus' uh, expression of why he came, what he came to accomplish, that I might, that I came, that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Now, I don't think that means that God solves all your problems. I don't think that means that you're going to be rich. I don't think that means you're never going to get sick. But what it's going to be is God is going to be present with you in every circumstance of life and give you joy in the midst of that. Amen. See, the world can understand joy that comes with prosperity. Boy, you won the lottery. I can understand when you, that you're joyful. Of course you would be. There's nothing supernatural or divine about that. But you have joy and you have cancer? Now all of a sudden that's something div divine. You're, you're seeking God to, to heal you of your temptation to overcome situations in your life, to overcome hurt and pain? Well, now that's supernatural. That's something that reflects God's glory, not just man's ability. And so again, that's a kind of joy. That's a kind of good news that God is bringing. Not necessarily good news that all your problems are going to be solved, but good news that God is going to be present with you in those problems and Jesus is the basis of the relationship for that. And so again, just a message. All the things they're saying, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. You know, in some ways, I think this is the best part of the message. Because you know something, if it's good news of great joy, and it's only for a select people, it's not really good news. And it's not bringing me great joy. I mean, this is a particularly significant thing for the angels to be, sit, to, to be speaking to Jewish shepherds who would think on some level that even though I'm an outcast of the religious society, being a Jewish person, I would have a special place in God's economy. I, I, I am part of the chosen people. And so God chose us and maybe didn't choose other people. And so for these angels to understand in terms of what Jesus is bringing, what God is introducing to the world through him, is that this is good news of great joy, which will be to all the people. 
See, no one is an outcast. No one is outside of God's provision. God is never going before anyone and saying, you know something, you, I really can't help. You know, you, you know, you come from this background, you look like this, you're in that family, you're born in this country, yeah, you know, we really don't like people like you. No, it's to all people. And what better way, what better group to reinforce that message than to go to these lowly shepherds and say, yeah, you guys are first. Of all the people that you could speak to in terms of, okay, I'm going to welcome someone to come to the birth of my son. You know, you know those invitations you send out? Come meet the baby. Come to our house. Come to the hospital. And, you know, who are you normally inviting to that? People that are Pharaoh, people that you like. I mean, this is basically God saying, I could invite the whole world. And guess what? I'm going to invite a bunch of shepherds. Again, the outcasts of society come to me. And that's God's message. I mean, God's message is to everyone. It's not like rich people don't know you need Jesus. Please, don't, don't hand me that. You know, the, the, the athletes need Jesus, and politicians need... <laughs> okay, politicians really need Jesus. But, uh, you know, and, but everyone needs Jesus. But, but really, I think the reason why the outcasts are identified is the outcasts from their human experience would say, well, you know something, if people have rejected me, if circumstances have rejected me, well, maybe God rejects me too. And that's why the message is, no, I'm a God that accepts, I'm a God that welcomes, but again, welcomes on His terms. And it has to be His terms, because He's the one that's God. He's the one that's creator. He's the one that has made you and knows you better than yourself. And so you can't come with your will and say, God, let me tell you a thing or two about what I need or what I think is best. Because you don't know the dynamic of yourself and you certainly don't know the dynamic of God of what he requires. But just to see what God's intent is, what his desire is, what his direction is in terms of what he's saying. Again, these angels are announcing really the, 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 the basic element of who Jesus is and what he's come to accomplish. You know, just think about the other things they could have said. You know, uh, I bring you bad news of no joy. They could have said that. I, I bring you news of the fact that God doesn't want you, so, so you know, you better find another way. Or all these different things, they, but he does, they don't say that. Israel is the best and God hates everyone else. They don't say that. It's good news of great joy to all the people. And so I think that's the introductory message. Then they put some meat on those bones in terms of what accomplishes that. Today in the town of David, that's what, you know, well, first of all, today is good because that means it's now. Who wants good news of great joy that's later? So today, in the town of David, which is prophesied, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. You know, what, what, what could be better news than God bringing a Savior? What could be better news to a broken humanity? What could be bread, better news for a, for a people, for humankind, that again is independent in its nature that has defied the standards of God, that is opposed to Him, that is walking away, and God says, you know something, I want to save you from yourself. I want to save you from your life. I want to save you from your condition and bring you to the place of relationship with me and provision for your life. So again, God is a, is a saving God. That God, in terms of whatever judgment He would have, that judgment has to be, has to be reinfor reinforced and has to be declared because God has to make a statement about the nature of sin. That ultimately, if God did not say that sin is bad, that he does not like it, that there's going to be judgment towards that, then what reason would we have to avoid sin? But also when we see what God's heart is toward that, and then in the midst of the reality of that, God says, I want to save you from that. I don't want to be a judging God. I want to be a saving God. And that's what the angels come to proclaim. And that's what they come to promote in terms of not only what he's saying to the shepherds, but what he's saying to everyone. Good news of great joy, yes. You need saving, I've got a savior. You need help, I've got help. 
You, you, you're, you're, you're a sheep that's just sent defenseless. Guess what? I've got a shepherd that can, that, that can uh, be your provision for you. And so again, that, that, that's, that's the essence. That's the meat on the bones of what the good news of great joy is. That a Savior is born. But notice that it's a Savior who's born that's Christ the Lord. I mean, He is the, the anointed one. He is the one with God's mark on Him. The identification of God's resource and God's uh, purpose in terms of what he's accomplishing. But see, not only is he just an anointed man, he is Christ the Lord. He is the anointed who is God. He's not the anointed, just anointed of God. He is the anointed that is God. So don't miss that, that this Savior, again, is the God-man. It is the one who will identify with both parties, both the divine and the human, to ultimately be the mediator that we need in order to be saved. See, the only way that I as a human being can be made right to a God that is divine is if, if, is if someone stands in the gap for me that represents me and my humanity and God and his divinity. And that's the sufficiency of Christ. That, that is what makes him the Savior. But again, it's Savior who is Christ the Lord, the promised one, the anointed one. And again, we all need that. See, does it make sense to you that really in any aspect of life, if someone says you need to be saved and you don't think you need to be saved, you won't be saved? You know, you're, you're, you're smoking your cigarettes and someone comes along and says, you know, so if you keep doing that, you're going to get cancer. But you don't care about that. You don't want to be saved from that. You just keep smoking away. Keep doing what you're doing. You know, in the same way that if God comes to you and says, I'm offering you salvation. But if you think, don't think you need it, if you think you're all right without it, well, guess what? Then you'll never receive it. So just understand that God is coming with an offer for you, but needs you to accept it. And the means by which you accept that is simply faith. And the reason why that dynamic of faith works is because it's really the only thing that we can offer as human beings. That ultimately, if, if God has done a great work, that God has accomplished all that is necessary for salvation, the only thing for us to do is choose to believe and accept that, to recognizing it's true, to recognizing our need for that. And again, that is the means, that is the, that is the connecting point. See, in some ways, it's no use to talk about a Savior who is Christ the Lord if we don't talk about how you connect to that Savior. You know, that would be in some ways maybe what is lacking in this, this angel song, but they can't say everything about everything. And so, but, but when they talk about the Savior that is Christ the Lord, just realize consistently throughout the Word, it is faith in Christ. It is belief in Him that ultimately brings that salvation. And so then they move on in terms of, again, just uh, today in the town of David, a Savior been born to you is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. I think the reason why they give them a sign is because there could have been other babies born in Bethlehem on that night. They need to, the means by which they identify the particular baby the angels are pointing to. And you know something, if you have heard anything about the significance of these cloths, I, I did you know, a bit of study on this in terms of how people want to make this more than what it is. You know, it's really probably just Mary doing what a mother would do and caring for her baby and making sure that her baby is protected. You know, some people have this thought that these are burial cloths that when, you, when the Jewish people were traveling on a long journey, they'd bring cloths to wrap a body in just in case someone died. Uh, and then th those, are the, those are the things that they wrap Jesus in. There's no uh, precedent for that. There's no, uh, the, the word that is used here does not support that thought. And so just realize other things that you might have heard. It's, it's probably just more of the normal things that um, would happen to a baby. But uh, the significant thing is, is that he'd be lying in a manger. And, and, and don't miss the contrast the juxtaposition, if you will, between Christ the Lord, the Savior who is Christ the Lord, and he's lying in a place where animals eat. 
You know, it really does talk about the kind of Savior we have, the kind of God God is, who, see, who seeks to reach down to the lowest to, to, to confound and confuse the highest, to take the weak things of the world, to, to confuse the strong, to ultimately cause them to wonder how is it that God can save someone who is weak when ultimately the order of the world, the way we conduct ourselves, is strength wins, strength ultimately conquers. And so moving on from that, suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. I mean, if it's not, to ju it's not enough to just have one angel and the glory of the Lord, God just continues to just expand what these, what these shepherds are exposed to and ultimately brings the celestial choir now, it was actually common in that day when a child was born to have people come to recognize the, the birth and sing songs of praise. So what could be more fitting than for the Son of God than have a celestial choir that is singing for Him? And again, don't miss what they say. Glory to God in the highest. In other words, the first thing to say about what, Jesus, what God is accomplishing through Christ is how great that makes God. In terms of what kind of God he is, what, 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 what he's willing to do, the, 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 the ways that God pursues us in terms of offering Jesus, and what that says about his power, what that says about his love, what that says about his compassion, what that says about his grace. And so when, again, these angels are, are, are praising and communicating and sharing the message first, it's glory to God in the highest, because the fact that Jesus has come says great things about him. It says something about his character and his nature, the kind of God that he is. But not only glory to God, but peace to men on whom his favor rests. You know, we've talked a lot about peace in terms of the different Bible studies that have happened in men's groups. And I think when it comes to our experience in life, one of the greatest things that we are looking for is peace. And to recognize that first and foremost, the peace that these angels are talking about is peace with God. You know, we, we recognize when our relationships are fractured, right? When you have a conflict with your friend, you have a conflict with a co-worker, you have a conflict with your child, you have a conflict with your husband or your wife, and we're disrupted in terms of, again, feeling uneasy about the fact that this relationship isn't right. Well, what could be worse than, or what is worse than that, is having your relationship with God not right. You know, I hope that we are disquieted in our hearts when our relationship with God isn't right. And so basically the first aspect of peace that, that these angels are talking about is peace with God. That whatever was broken about your relationship with God, whatever, whatever uh, conflict or disruption your sin brought into that relationship, ultimately God is offering you peace. Ultimately, God is willing to fix that relationship so you can be in harmony with Him. And the point that I would make to you, I know it's a, the, the premise of my life, if I am right with God, I don't have to be right with really anything else in terms of what I'm dependent on. Now, because I'm right with God, He drives me to be right with everything. I'm an ambassador of peace, I'm an ambassador of reconciliation, I'm an ambassador of love, but if that's not received, or circumstances don't, don't reinforce that, if I have peace with God, none of that matters. If, I, if the backbone of my life, is the, if the foundation I'm standing on is my relationship with God is right, you know, if I'm working through conflict with my wife or my kids or some friend of mine to know that my relationship with God is right, that is the foundation of that. That is, a, that is the basis for, from which we work in our existence and how we negotiate through life. And so it is, again, first and foremost, it is peace with God, and then it is the peace of God in terms of what reigns in our hearts, in terms of being settled, being confident of, again, uh, the, 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 the way our souls are centered in terms of the, the affirmation of, of a confident expectation of what God is accomplishing, what God has promised, and what God is affording us in our life. That brings us peace in terms of just the condition of our heart. Even as the world is in disarray, even as circumstances are whirling around us, there's an eye of the storm. There's a place of peace that we can be in because of the peace of God. So the peace with God 
and the peace of God. Just moving on in terms of completing the passage. Uh, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her hearts. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. You know, you talk about an extreme makeover. You, you, you talk about these shepherds that were in one state and one condition at the beginning of our story and how God transformed them. They're, they're afraid. They're, they're outcasts. They're, they're, they're distant from the religious system and from society. And God welcomes them in. Welcomes them into a relationship with Him. Welcomes them into the, uh, the just inviting God to the earth. And then they go away praising God. Not afraid, but praising. But I think there are things that we can model as we consider the extreme makeover that God would want to make in our lives, what do the shepherds do? I think the first thing they do is they, sh they choose to seek God out. They follow through on that curiosity. That ultimately, the angels appear. They gave the message. The shepherds didn't necessarily need to go. But the right thing they did is they followed through. What I'm mystified by and troubled by as well is the people that have promptings from God. You might have a conversation with them. They might be in the context of a message. God is clearly moving. God is clearly drawing. God is clearly showing them something. And you know something? They don't pursue it. They, they don't go. They just say, you know something? That was kind of neat, but I'm just going to stay where I am. I mean, you know the definition of insanity, right? Is to do the same things and expect different results. You know, so maybe, maybe the extreme makeover starts with you recognizing the fruit of your life and the consequences you're bearing are the very testimony that the decisions you're making are wrong. And so basically coming to God and saying, God, I need to seek you. I need to pursue whatever promptings there are in my heart, whatever convictions I have, whatever directions you're leading me to, and making sure that, again, I am doing my part, that clearly God has done his part in sending Jesus, and I'm going to do my part in pursuing and believing. So the first thing the angels, the, the shepherds do, rather, in terms of reinforcing their makeover so they can receive from God what God has brought them, is they go. They, they, they followed the problem. They hurried off and found Mary and Joseph the baby who was lying in the manger. I think the second thing is that they're willing to leave behind what they see as important to find what God sees as important. You know, something that I do wonder is as these shepherds leave the sheep, who's watching the sheep? <laughs> you know, you know, some, you know, did you ever think things? Anyway, yeah, you start thinking think deeply about the scripture. So there's probably hired hands or high, like they, the main shepherds go, other people are still watching the sheep, but they were still risking something. In order to find what God had, they had to leave what they were doing. And isn't that so consistently part of our makeover? You know, when you were, if, and I don't think that show was even on anymore, but you remember what that was like. You know, they had beauticians and hair and makeup people and sometimes surgeons to give belly tucks and so on and so forth. I mean, did you ever see someone getting an extreme makeover and saying, you know some? can you bottle up that fat? I'd like to take it, to take it with me. No. Oh, no, I want to go back to the way I used to dress after, after seeing the, the radical change that comes. And yet, how often does that happen? That again, we pursue God, we find God to be faithful, we see that He is operating and working in a certain way, but again, we're clinging to the things of the past. We're not, we're not pursuing Him without, a, without an arm reaching back at the things that God is asking us to leave. So ultimately, any extreme makeover that God would accomplish in us is us leaving our perspective, leaving our ideas, leaving our priorities, and ultimately clinging to what God is leading us to. And the shepherds do that. They leave the sheep and go and find Jesus. I think it's not far-fetched to think that they actually believe because an essential part of believing is spreading the word. So in other words, they... they they had a, a, a miraculous thing revealed to them through the angel. The angel communicated a message. They then 
saw that what the angel said was true, but then in response to that, and the glory of what it is, and the majesty of seeing Jesus, they said, I'm going to tell someone about this. And that's another part of our extreme makeover. That whatever change God would wrought in our lives becomes a passion and a conviction in terms of what we share with other people. See, they, they, they were impacted. And in, and in some ways, we only know that we're impacted by something when we share it with people. Like, how convinced are you of the faith you have, the valuable things you find in God, if you're not willing to tell other people about it? Because it can't be all that valuable. I mean, if you really don't think that, that God's salvation is needed for everyone, that the consequence of someone not believing in Jesus and being forgiven based in His blood and having the righteousness of God through faith, and that will ultimately lead someone to hell if they don't believe that, and you're not willing to share your faith with people? I mean, to me, that has to translate to the fact that you really don't believe that. But see, these shepherds are convinced of what, they, what has been communicated. Now, God gives them a good unction to believe, a good reason to believe in terms of the miracle they see. But they're still, there. they're still following through for their makeover to happen, for them to be different. See, they're going to ultimately go back and be shepherds. But I bet they'll be different shepherds after seeing Jesus. After this moment, life will never be the same. Can you imagine any of those shepherds not talking about that event the next time they're watching sheep? The, the, uh, five months later, hey, remember that time when we were just sitting around the fire like this? And boom, the angel was here. They would think, that, of course, that that would be on their lips and their mind for the rest of their lives. Well, to what extent is that true of us? That, wow, in terms of my salvation, wow, in terms of God's work, wow, in terms of God's leading. How passionate am I to tell people about that? And looking at how much, what that says, ultimately, about the faith that I have, how much do I believe it if I'm not willing to share it? Well, I think we are convinced, I think we know that God wants to do an extreme makeover in our lives. Ultimately, to bring us to faith and belief in Jesus, if we haven't done that, but as we believe in Jesus, ultimately looking to the transformation in terms of us becoming more and more like His Son, Jesus. And just remember the things the shepherds tell us, that we need to continue to pursue God. We need to be willing to leave behind our presuppositions, our presumptions, our priorities, and follow what God is leading us to, and then be willing to share other pe to, to other people what God has wrought in our life. Amen? Amen. Amen? Let's follow and let's pray. Father, just do come before you and just thank you for what you've accomplished. I, I am always struck every Christmas that I'm exposed to just the miracles that you perform to show that you are on the move. And people in Jerusalem knew that you were on the move. People in Palestine knew that you were on the move. And these shepherds were part of the testimony in terms of just what you did. Father, what that speaks to us who feel like we're lowly. So to those of us that, again, really haven't connected with society. In some ways, I think this really is everyone. That even those that are popular and successful, there's an emptiness of heart. There's that place where, you know, something the world just can't fulfill. And so there's a gap there. There's a loneliness there. You know, when I think about the rich and wealthy people that are addicted to drugs or, or uh, just pursuing passions that are destructive to them because life is never enough. And so, Father, I believe that in some ways all of us are that lowly outcast. We are, all of us need a relationship with you to fill the void that is in our life. And so, Father, I pray for anyone here that has never believed in Jesus, has never come to that point where they're connect, connected their need, their disobedience, their sinfulness to the grace and forgiveness of God expressed through Christ. In some ways, what better time? Well, maybe Easter might be better, but, but Christmas in terms of just recognizing the very reason why Jesus came to save, to make a relationship with you possible. And so, Father, I just pray that anyone here that has not expressed the faith that you require of us to get Jesus, 
that they would express that faith, that they would pray a prayer similar to God. I recognize that I'm a sinner and I'm in need of salvation. I believe in Jesus. I trust that what he said and did was true. And I, I, I just recognize my need for him and I accept the gift that he gave in terms of his death to satisfy your righteousness. And so, Father, some aspect of those kinds of words expressed in faith, believing God to be true, believing Christ and what he accomplished at the cross to be true, that, Father, that's what you're asking us of. Or for those who are, have never done that, I just pray for them, that you would lead them to that. They would just continue to pursue you in terms of whatever you may be fostering in their life. And, Father, for the rest of us, in need of an extreme makeover, which is, that is true for all of us, and an extreme makeover of soul, of intent, of desire, of passion, of direction, of purpose, not of body, but all those things are of godliness and spirituality. Father, I just pray that uh, you would just further convict us of the steps we would take to make that reality, that we wouldn't let this die on the vine, that we wouldn't let, that let this spark but this fire die out, but continue to pursue it to the, to the end of becoming the people you call us to be. It's in your Son, Jesus Christ's name, that we do pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>